Hello, everyone. Welcome to Talking Logistics, where we have conversations with thought leaders and newsmakers in the supply chain logistics industry. It's my great pleasure to welcome today's program, Russ Felker, who is Chief Technology Officer at Global Trans, and Hi. Prasad Galopoli, who is founder and CEO at Trucker Tools. And today we're going to talk about scaling your technology up to enhance customer engagement. Now, all the words that we used to talk about with regards to supply chain logistic, logistics, you know, agile, responsive, flexible, you know, they went from being kind of concepts to being, you know, strategic imperatives, you know, over the past year, you know, due in large part, you know, to the pandemic. And this is true for all stakeholders in the industry, including, you know, logistics service providers. Mm -hmm. um, and it has also kind of fueled or sparked you know, a renewed focus on digital transformation. So how is technology helping logistics service providers respond to the changing needs of shippers and carriers? Which capabilities have become must have? And, uh, you know, how do you measure success moving forward? So those are some of the key questions we're going to address in today's episode. And it's great to have Russ and, uh, you know, Prasad with us to share their insights and advice on this topic. So Russ, Prasad, welcome to the program. Thanks so much. Thanks for the opportunity. Well, Russ, uh, you're a first time guest here on, on Talking Logistics. So kind of before we dive into, into this topic, I'm always curious a little bit about, you know, uh, the backgrounds of folks and how they get involved in this industry. So before we dive into this topic, why don't you tell us, you know, briefly a little bit about uh, yourself, Global Trends and your operations and, uh, you know, kind of what your current role and responsibilities are there. Sure, absolutely. And Global Trans is a uh, top 10 3PL, uh, been in business for uh, you know, a few decades now and uh, have always been focused on uh, really technology leading and, and, and leading through technology and using technology to further uh, the, the, the environment for our shippers and for our carriers and for our staff. Uh, I'm in charge, of course, around all of that, all of that technology. <laughs> so that's, that's kind of what I do uh, at, at Global Trans. And um, you know, working across brokerage, which is a, a core offering that we have, as well as managed transportation, and really becoming that, that fourth party logistics provider, that outsourced logistics provider for our customers um, has you know, forced us to take even more, a, a deeper look really at, at technology and how we can leverage that across those different activities uh, to, to bring a better experience for our customers, for our carriers, for our partners. Uh, and, and, and so we've been, we've been doing a lot of that, of course, as you mentioned over the last year, especially. <laughs> Yeah, no, absolutely. You know, I've, I've been an industry analyst now for, for almost 22 years. I know, you know, when I first started, um, you know, the concept of, of a logistics service provider having a chief technology officer, you know, that, that was kind of a rare title, you know, for, for someone because IT, you know, not to say that IT wasn't important 20, 30 years ago, you know, it certainly was, but, you know, certainly the role and importance of technology in the industry has been, uh, you know, skyrocketed, you know, in, in, sure. just in the, the past you know, 20 years and, you know, the profile and the role and responsibilities of someone in your position of chief, you know, technology officer has also, you know, been more in the spotlight, you know, certainly, uh, you know, over the past few years. So, and I think we saw that, you know, come to bear in, in, in 2020. So let's, let's start there, Russ, I'll, I'll, I'll stay with you here. I mean, sure. looking back at, at 2020, you know, it's clear that, you know, companies that embraced, you know, digital transformation, you know, before the pandemic, you know, were the ones that were able to navigate, you know, navigate successfully through, you know, the impact that the pandemic had, mm -hmm. you know, versus those that really hadn't, you know, uh, invested in technology or, or were kind of standing by the sidelines. So how did, you know, technology help Global Trans respond to the, the changing needs and requirements of, of shippers and carriers in the market? Well, there were, you know, a number of different ways. Uh, obviously, there was a lot of application of technology from an internal perspective in, allowing us to deal with what became for many companies, not just us, but uh, you know, as, we, as we all look at our, our home backgrounds uh, <laughs> that we see here, uh, you know, becoming a remote company. Uh, and it's not just us that did that though. It was, uh, it was shippers, it was carriers, it was everyone who moved into that space. And so really it was about flexibility. And, and, and flexibility from the perspective of there were different ways that, that information needed to be moved back and forth between our partners, our shippers, our carriers, and, and, and enabling that flexibility and using technologies that, that ranged from 
uh, you know, uh, uh, kind of service oriented architectures that focused on that the software that allowed for those interactions uh, and more effectively supported them in a digital sense to uh, RPA and, you know, the use of bots and, and, and those type of functions to move information, uh, not just between external parties and internal parties, but even internally to get it to the right place, to communications infrastructures uh, that were necessary to make sure that people could be, you could get to somebody effectively uh, and that you could talk to the right person uh, that you needed to and, and making sure that, that those options were all made available, that they were out there, that they were, uh, that they were uh, in place to allow for those consistent interactions. Because regardless of the digitization of a process and regardless of the amount of digitization that we put into a process, in the end, it's still people that need to interact in many senses. And so I think that while digital transformation is good and it is, it is something that we've all had to embrace in some ways, and we have embraced, it's also been something that we've needed, we've taken to that level of how do we enable that for people to more effectively interact? Um, that, even yeah, just the technology we're using now is a good Yeah, that's a, that. you know, that's, that's a great point. I mean, it's amazing how, you know, almost overnight, you know, like you said, you know, everyone went from, you know, their work environment and offices to having to figure out a way to keep the, their businesses running and responding to, in some cases, huge spikes in demand and in other, industri in other industries, you know, uh, decline in demand, but still having to figure out, you know, how to navigate through that uh, other shock, uh, but doing it from home. And at the end of the day, like you said, it's, it's, it's being able to empower people with technology to keep these processes running and, and enabling them to have the visibility to the information, to the data, so on and so forth, to make those decisions. And obviously in, in, in cases where, you know, you can apply automation, you, you know, to it, you know, that, that's always that part of the story there in terms of how do you, you, you know, are able to then scale your business, you know, cause you just can't keep throwing people at, at these processes, uh, you know, either. Um, but, but I think that's a great, you know, that's a great point in terms of, you know, technology, you, you know, not only from a, uh, connecting companies and their systems together, exchanging information, but technology also as a way to empower people, you know, to do their job wherever the, wherever they may be. And I, I was just reading the Wall Street Journal. Uh, actually, it's been in in the news for the past few weeks. You know, a number of companies are thinking that this is the new normal now, right? That they may never, they may not go back to, you know, the old real estate, you know, requirements that they had of having, you know, headquarters with a bunch of people. That, you know, moving forward, it might be this hybrid model where people might be working from home multiple days a week or in in more remote areas. So I think, you know, this transition is something that's probably going to be a permanent, uh, permanent change. Uh, so Prasad, to, to kind of bring you into the conversation, I mean, you and I have talked over the past couple of years uh, about a, a lot of different topics, you know, related to, to the, the space and the role that technology has, has played. And, and it, it kind of got me thinking, I mean, in, in your conversations with, you know, with brokers and logistics service providers, um, you, I mean, I, I assume that some capabilities that might have been when you were talking to them two, three, four years ago, that might have been nice to have capabilities have now moved into the must have category. I mean, what, what are some of those things that now, you know, are definitely in that must have category? You know, it, it, thanks for, for pointing that thing, um, Adrian. Definitely, you know, when, when you look at in 2020, things almost got, you know, a technology adoption that normally would have taken three, three to five years, got shrunk down to six months. And that's primarily, you know, everything that Russ said earlier, right? Everyone had to change overnight and adopt to something different, whether it's the freight that they move or operations. And in both these cases, the the things that typically, you know, low, um, more manual work with little reward, those types of tasks really got automated. Those were like, okay, nice to have, right? So for example, visibility. We knew visibility was catching on. But literally overnight, everybody said, hey, we, we need 100% visibility, as opposed to 60% visibility, 40% are only the shippers that need visibility. I'm going to provide that to 100% visibility. I can't have people make check calls. I mean, when, I'm, when I have people working from home, you know, that's the last thing I want them to do is you know, call a driver and say where he is. Right? So um, visibility became a table standard, but more importantly, it became 100% requirement. Now, the later part of the year, 
there is another thing that added to the visibility that is not just visibility, but visibility converted into information. If a load is delayed, I want to know it. I want to know it <coughs> ahead of time. So <clears throat> what are my alternatives to share with the ship, all right? That part has already started big, you know, used to be a nice to have to a must, right? Um, the other area is digital freight matching. You know, I, this was earlier what you both were talking about it. Everybody wanted to know where can I, where are, where is my capacity? But more importantly, how can technology help me scale my reach to carriers? And with little work, can I get these loads covered? So in in you know a year later, people would say, well, I can I can put a person on a phone and make 30, 40 calls to cover a load. To this is an obvious load. This is an obvious car carrier that I've been working on. I don't need to spend any more time on that load. That carrier would take it at a decent rate. Let me just quickly move that out, right? So this, I call those as, you know, the low hanging fruit where people were trying to say, can I still do it manually to got shifted very fast. Um, the biggest adopter last year was Bukitna. Literally every, every broker that we spoke to left all the, the initial steps of digital freight matching went to the fully automated book it now. They said, hey, we want book it now directly, right? Um, that shows the pace at which the, the broker community has been uh, adopting to technology. Yeah, yeah a lot, lot of great points. There, more. I think. Yeah. yeah, Ross, I know you want, you, if you want to add to that. No, I mean, it, I, th I think that's, that's it, you know, a lot of what you said was critical, especially around that, just automating those things as they come out and as they, uh, uh, you know, as you're trying to get information out in the marketplace, get information back from the, you know, more, well, I'll call almost the logistics community and, and, and integrate all of those flows of information that you, that you just spoke about when it comes to Book It Now, digital freight matching, you know, the tracking and, and even moving beyond the blue dot. And moving to that, you know, order level tracking and, and where's my thing, not where's the truck uh, and, and those types of, uh, of, of systems and, and information flows. Right. Yeah. And a lot, a lot of great points. And I think, you know, the point you made, uh, Prasad, in terms of, you know, just the, the accelerated rate that, you know, this is all taking place, which obviously it's, it's great for, you know, you know, providers, you know, such, such as yourselves, but, but also, you know, um, and this leads to my next question for you, Ross, I mean, you know, there's so many opportunities, you, you know, out there, right? So many areas that you can focus on uh, when it comes to technology. Um, you know, I think the challenge then becomes, you know, how do you prioritize, right? What to work on next? So I guess that's my question for you, Russ. I mean, how do you internally, how do you prioritize what to work on next? And, and how do you approach the, you know, like everyone, whether you're a shipper or a carrier or whatever, you know, you always have that, well, do we build it? Do we buy it? Do we partner for this capability? You know, how do you approach that question as well? Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's, always, a, it's always a fun question uh, because it depends a little on who you talk to, <laughs> as, to as to how that prioritization falls out. Um, you know, I, 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 we look at two kind of different things and, and this is, you know, something, you know, there's value created. What's the value that we're creating by doing this action? Whatever that action may be. Um, you know, implementing this technology, putting this automation into place, something like that. And some of those are very easily measurable, and some of those are not as easily measurable, uh, at least not on the surface. Uh, but I, I'd say there's, there's a couple of different things that, that, that came out really in the last year um, that are important. And, you know, ROI was always kind of this big, that's your bellwether of, of, hey, this has the best ROI, so we want to make sure that this is up here at the top, and this is something that we're truly going to be doing. But there's been also a change in focus to the reverse of the ROI or the inverse of the ROI, which is the investment that, that you know, allows for that return and the core foundational pieces. And that's come into more clear focus, I think. You know, there's, there's a lot of things that people have invested in and, and have prioritized over the years that have had a very top line, obvious kind of, 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 of front facing value, but we haven't looked at those underlying pieces and done the IOR, that investment that's, that's underscoring the return, the investment that enables that return. And that piece, like whether it's cloud enablement, whether that is, uh, you know, uh, having a 
very resilient and disaster uh, uh, prone or disaster proof type system. And those investments don't necessarily translate right to, oh, and I saved this amount of time for this person or this amount of money. It, you know, it, but it, they're necessary to allow for those things to occur. And I think what's happened is companies have started to recognize that those underlying investments are some of the things that have to be prioritized alongside of the front facing things. You can't ignore either one. And, and that's where uh, there's been some, I, I think, change within just not just our industry, but, but, but globally as far as how people approach that type of value, you know, value creation and, and where is the, how is the value being created and how do I prioritize my actions and my activities to make sure that I'm setting, not just creating value today, but setting myself up to create value later by my actions that I'm doing today. And so those are, those are some of the things that have really come into focus for, for us as a company and, and I think for, for, the, for our industry in general. Yeah, not to, I, I, I love that perspective. You know, as you were talking, I mean, it's almost, you know, just to make the house analogy. I mean, sometimes you do have to invest in the foundation, right? I mean, you can't build a beautiful <laughs> house that's going to, you know, build equity over time if it doesn't have a foundation, right? So the yeah. only way you can build a house, you got to start with, you know, building that, that foundation. And sometimes, you know, it's building that foundation that's going to lead to the future, you know, ROI. And I would think another, I think another area that I see, uh, I'd like you to quickly comment on it is that, you know, it's also thinking about the value or the benefit, not only internally, right? Things that show up on the p and and balance mm -hmm. sheet and so forth, but also from a customer experience standpoint, right? From, from your yes. shippers, right? You know, how, how is this going to bring value to the shipper? Are we going to be able to compete or differentiate ourselves from the competition in the eyes of our shipper clients, as well as in the eyes of our carrier partners, right? So I think that's part of the Absolutely. value proposition as well, right? Yeah, it is absolutely, and and you know, working within and and you know, really taking it visibility is is a good, you know, really bellwether of that, because visibility has impacts across everything we've been talking about. Uh, the visibility into just you know, kind of the point in time visibility, as well as the impacts to that visibility, as well as just the visibility of being able to move information back and forth, has experience impacts on our shippers on us as a 3PL, on our partners, and on the, the carriers that we interact with. And so publishing that information out, getting that information to those groups and receiving that information in from those groups and making it just as seamless as possible, as I kind of talked about before, is so critical and, and, and creates so much value. By doing something for one group, generally you're actually impacting almost everybody throughout the chain. And, and visibility is a great example of that. Um, I know right. Prasad, Prasad and I have had a lot of conversations about just those things. <laughs> yeah, absolutely right. It is, you know, it is taking that information, but I think it's, you know, customers asking, right? I mean, the customers like Global Trans Trust, right? You know, asking us um, both in terms of the functionality, but, also go beyond that, right? The, when I talk about the functionality, asking the, the data itself, right? How often are you guys going to provide this? What's the consistency of it? What's the reliability of it? You know, but also asking, you know, how quickly, you know, if we go from here, from our freight volume, I'm, I remember having that conversation with them, the very, very beginning, they were trying to, you know, they were looking at doubling their, their, their uh, brokerage and running in that rate. When that happens, is the partner ready to do that? Uh, having those questions are very, very important because it's the, the service itself, but the service consistency, service reliability at a higher level for their shippers is, is as critical as anything else. Yeah, good, good point. And that, that brings me to kind of a question for you, Prasad. I mean, building on top of that, um, you know, when you look at a, a partner like, you know, Global Trans and you look at some of your other, you know, companies that, that you work with and you say, okay, what is it that makes a successful relationship between you and Global Trans, you and some of the other customers? I mean, what, what are some of the attributes that define a successful customer technology company partnership? You know, the, the, the very first thing is, you know, I was trying to encapsulate that, that whole relationship, right? I, you know, it might look a little cheesy, but I'll, I'll say for what it's worth, right? Like any other relationship, it is a, it's a relationship like between two people, two individuals, like whether you call it a marriage, right? A, a relationship between a husband and wife. Knowing that 
both are not going to be perfect. Meaning, um, the reason I say that is when you get a technology vendor for a broker, we have to know that both are moving targets because a brokerage is growing, their requirements are changing. A technology solution is evolving. So if you look at them in a standstill movement, there might be perfect. But as we evolve, it has to stay perfect, right? That is the key to a relationship. So starting a relationship is the easiest part in this, but building that relationship and that long-term relationship is important, which means as a, as a vendor, your customer should ask you, I'm a technology vendor, right? So we, our customers should ask us, what's your long-term plan? Where, are, where is your roadmap? What are your milestones? Two, they should also share their milestones, like their technology strategy. What do they expect from technology vendors or technology in, in general? How are these two things aligned, right? When these two things are aligned well and at every interval, right? How do we touch point? Hey, we're, you know, we are adding this new tool. Okay, is it aligned with what Global Trends needs, right? Or talking to them every single day. Or, you know, single day is an exaggeration, but that regular connection, right? What's working out for you with our tool? What's not working out? You know, a lot of vendors really don't want to ask this question. Asking your customer what is not working with our tool is, is like really a bad thing in vendor's mind. But I see that as a big value because that tells us where do we add new tools, new investment in our technology, in our support, to really make value for future, right? If you don't do that, a lot of times in our space, especially these relationships start very well, but then they fall apart very quickly because the customer has evolved in a direction where the vendor is not going. And that to me is the biggest, biggest opportunity. If you're a vendor or you're a customer to really bridge, to stay together. You know, I love the relationship analogy. And just to go back to what, uh, you know, Russ said before, you know, a key part of this is, you know, it goes back to the people aspect as well, right? It's communication, you know, between people, right? Between, you know, yourself and Russ, right? Between some of your colleagues and some of Russ's colleagues, right? And having that honest and transparent and ongoing, you know, discussions around what's happening in the market, what technology needs are changing, what's not working to your point, um, you know, I think through honest and open and ongoing communication, just like in a marriage, just like in any other you know, friendship or any other kind of human relationship, I think it's it, it, it similarly uh, applies here. And I, I, I assume you would agree with that as well, Russ. Absolutely. Although I'm still waiting on my ring. Uh, <laughs> uh, 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 <laughs> well, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll take that offline and, and figure that one out. We can, that we one can out. handle that later. That's fine. Yeah. Uh, I, I've heard it's been out being cleaned. I, I don't know. But anyway. <laughs> Uh, no, you know, he it, was just waiting. He was absolutely. just waiting to get that right big one for. for I get it. I get it. Yeah. <laughs> I know. I probably have to run to Tiffany now. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's great. That's great. So, so Russ, you know, um, let, let's look now forward, right? I mean, what's next on your digital transformation journey, and, and how can technology partners like you know Trucker Tools help you get there? Yeah, absolutely. The you know, as as Prasad mentioned, there's a lot of things going on. I think, especially within. Um, uh, the different freight markets and, and, and being able to more effectively give customers, give shippers what they need from a, a point in time perspective, but also from that, from that uh, uh, you know, really information perspective. So here's a data point, but here's what that data point means in the context of not just a shipment, but your shipment and your supply chain and your, you know, your activities. That's where I see uh, uh, we're making a lot of strides and moving more into that direction. We're working with you know, groups like Trucker Tools to help us to, to get that data, to, to work together, to provide that type of information out to our shippers, out to our carriers, uh, and, and, and even do things that improve individual points within, within the, 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 the arrangement and the, the, the engagement with them, you know, within the shippers, helping them to understand the downstream or even upstream impacts of different things that are happening. From the carrier's perspective, helping them to just get better, better arms wrapped around, hey, I'm going from A to B. Is there something I can go from B to A with? You know, we wanna be not just good partners, we want to be good 
uh, you know, uh, logistics citizens, and we want to be good citizens of, of the world. And, and, and all of those things kind of come together to help a shipper understand, well, here's the optimal way you could arrange your shipments based on the type of shipments that you do, the carriers that you're using. And hey, carrier, here's, here's some options for you to make sure that we're not doing power only moves, that we're, that we're keeping people busy, we're keeping people not just paid, but we're, we're, we're having value attributed to the effort that's being put forth, uh, regardless of, of where you are in that chain and which, which of the partners that you are. And so that, that is, that, that's a key piece of the digital journey. I, I wouldn't say just of, of, of global trans and, 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 and trucker tools, but really of, of the industry, of, of, of our industry. Uh, there's been a lot of investment in technology. There's been a lot of new technology companies that have come out and a lot of focus on how does logistics use technology to be more effective, more efficient, and more resilient within everything that we do. Uh, and and it's a, I think it's a very exciting time uh, in, in these last, the last year definitely accelerated it, uh, but even in the last few years, there have just been consistent investment and, and new technology coming out, new ways of using, even if it's not new technology, it's just ways of using the technology and applying the technology to get better outcomes for everybody. Yeah, no, I, I, absolutely. I mean, I think the one thing that's certain moving forward is that the rate of pace and the, the pace of innovation is only going to, you know, accelerate. And I think one of the, the few, if, if only positive things that came out of the pandemic so far is that it has elevated the role and importance of supply chain and logistics, not only within those of us that are living and breathing every day, but within the general public. And I think they, they understand now the importance of you know, this, this industry that they're in, in terms of getting product from A to B and, and moving product across borders and everything, in, everything in between. Right. So I think, you know, we're going to continue to see that, that uh, pace of innovation continue and technology obviously is going to be, you know, a key enabler uh, of all that. Um, you know, we're running short on time. So I'm just going to go right to my last question, Russ, I'll start with you and then Prasad, you can, you can wrap things up, you know, so how will, Brokers, logistics service providers measure success then moving forward, and and what metrics should they focus on? You know, to me, a lot of what we've been focusing on in the past, there's been, of course, in, in anything you do that's a business support, there's a cost focus. There's a you know what's the what's the cost of doing this? But I, I feel like we've moved a bit beyond that to an extent to what is the what is the efficiency level? What is the consistency? And what is the resiliency of what you're doing? And last year, hard, hard point on that resiliency <laughs> from last year, I think we all know. And so metrics that are focused around that efficiency enablement, not just from a cost perspective, but from an overall logistics and, and supply chain network perspective, the resiliency of that network and how it is able to continue operations even when a piece or two or three pieces have an issue and how do we recognize that quickly, respond to it quickly and have the plans in place to, to execute against it. Um, and, and metrics around those types of, of, of approaches to logistics, I think are gonna be critical and key for how we move forward uh, as an industry. Great, great points. Prasad, your thoughts? You know, what Russ said is, is absolutely right. There are a lot of these, you know, metrics that are very, very important, right? And then more importantly, it's not a, it's a moving target, right? We've, at Trucker Tools, we've always looked at, you know, what's the variable cost of covering a load for a broker, our customer, right? Our customer's metric is, is our metric too. And how do we influence, how do we bring it down? And what, which when, once you start breaking that into parts, right? It, it you know, how many, your repeat carriers add to that, right? Um, the more repeat carriers you have, the, the less your variable cost comes down to. Um, the time it takes to cover a load, the shorter it is, the lower that value comes down. So these, you know, you can see once you start coming from that matrix down, all other numbers start adding up very well. If we, you know, as a vendor, we have to know that while we have our own company matrix, but for a business, 
our customers' metrics are our metrics too. When we align so closely with them, right, we're together product in the future. And this is a, you know, we, we tell customers from get-go, don't be, you know, shy in telling us where we lack. And likewise, we train our people to ask that question, what else can we do better? Right. This is a very important question because this is like, like Russ said, there are certain things that we can measure, but we have to embed in our culture to start building this process. Right. We're together, we're really changing this pace. I mean, those who thought uh, transportation is laggers, I want them to come and see what we're doing in this space, all of us. Um, you know, we're, we're moving things and, you know, someday, you know, very, very recently, Amazon said we're going to deliver on, on the same day, and the industry stood by it, right? Um, hours, people are going to deliver stuff within hours. This is all happening because of the great things that our community, our industry is doing. Um, we, we, we don't get that much credit for what we do. Absolutely. And like I said, I think, you know, finally, I think, you know, uh, you know, we're finally getting the recognition that, that, that it deserves. Well, you know, like I always say at the end of all our episodes, you know, we always manage to scratch the surface on these topics and, uh, but both of you provided some great insights and advice on, on, on this topic. So again, Russ, Prasad, thank you for making the time to be with us today. Thanks for having me. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity. I want to thank those of you that joined us. If you're watching this episode on demand, either at the Trucker Tools website or on Talking Logistics, and you've got a question or a comment for Russ or Prasad, you can post it there. And I'm sure they'll be more than happy to respond via that medium. Again, thank you for joining us and look forward to seeing you in a future episode of Talking Logistics. Have a great day.